Good afternoon, folks. Has anybody enjoyed the first half of our conference, our first third of our conference? Well, give yourself a hand. You get, I've, I've uh, I had the pr privilege of sampling every single uh, 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 session, and they've been wonderful. The, the, the presentations and the questions have been great. It's a great dialogue. We appreciate it, and I think it's going to be even better as we go along. We uh, will now uh, have a lunchtime program that will start, and we'll start with a, a short presentation and, and uh, talk by our lunchtime sponsor, National Grid. Um, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Robert Teets, uh, the Vice President of Environmental Services at National Grid. So a big hand for Mr. Teets, and also the, for uh, Jim Barker, who joined us, who was our sponsor at Plenary. So both, both of them, Mr. Teets and Mr. Barker. And uh, welcome to lunch. We're very proud at National Grid to be able to uh, be a sponsor of this great event. And uh, we congratulate uh, MWA for all the great work that they're doing uh, to revitalize the waterfront here in, in New York. Uh, so who is National Grid? If you don't know about us, we are an uh, international energy company, uh, electric and gas business. Um, we have 19 million industrial customers, commercial customers, and residential customers around the uh, up, upper part of uh, U.S. and in the U.K. And uh, we're very pleased to uh, be focused on the environment as part of our core mission. In fact, we're proud to have been named by Newsweek recently uh, in their 500 green company ranking uh, throughout uh, the international uh, scene as the number one uh, utility uh, in terms of the green ranking. So we're very happy about that. But although we are large uh, and, and cover a number of states here in the US, we are very locally minded and locally focused. And um, we have a very particular interest here in downstate New York. Uh, about 60% of our total business is in New York. And we have a tremendous focus here, right here in the five boroughs. In fact. Uh, as environmental VP, uh, the waterfront down here in New York City actually pulses through my veins because I grew up down here. Grew up in Queens, right near the uh, Newtown Creek, went to high school in Brooklyn, uh, next to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, went to college in Staten Island, took that ferry back and forth uh, every day, and then worked in a number of power plants right on the East River. So the, uh, the infrastructure down here is something that uh, I know quite well. If we could flip to that next slide. Um, National Grid is very, very committed to improving the, uh, the waterfront infrastructure um, in New York City. We have inherited a number of old manufactured gas plants uh, along the Gowanus Canal and the Newtown Creek, and we are absolutely committed to doing our part to see them get cleaned up and to improve the uh, water quality in the creek and uh, the Gowanus Canal. Uh, we expect to spend over $200 million in the next uh, 10 years or so to accomplish that. And uh, we're partnering and taking a leadership position with EPA and our friends at New York City uh, to, to execute that work. Um, we have four goals in doing that. Number one, sound science. Uh, as mentioned by uh, the Colonel this morning, sound science and innovation are essential if we're going to minimize the cost to do this. Second is we want to have sustainable water quality result at the end of the day. Uh, we don't want to do this piecemeal. It needs to be done comprehensively. Third, community engagement. Uh, we have to do this with the community that surrounds these water bodies to make sure that the economic development that goes forth is something that's completely integrated and compatible with the needs of the community. And lastly, we have to do it in an equitable manner. There are literally hundreds of responsible parties uh, that have uh, contributed to the legacy contamination of these water bodies. And we need to find out who they are and get them to join the party. National Grid and New York City are leading on this, but others need to step up to the plate uh, to make it happen. Uh, your next panel will be addressing climate change. And National Grid is very much involved in climate change and trying to do something about it. Number one, 
We have internal goals to reduce our own carbon footprint by 45 percent by um, 2020 and 80 percent uh, by 2050, and we're well on the way to doing that. Um, one of the things that we've done recently is tied executive compensation to the reduction in greenhouse gases on a year-by-year -year basis. So you can tell that I'm very much interested in making sure that happens. Uh, the other thing we're doing in New York City is we're strengthening and improving the natural gas infrastructure. Uh, many of the pipelines down here in, in the boroughs are over 60 to 70 years old, and we're spending uh, well over $100 million to improve the capacity and the reliability of the gas system. That will enable uh, significant reductions in, in uh, heavy, number six and number four, oil uh, displacement. If we can reduce the number of uh, homes and businesses heating with heavy industrial fuel oils, we can improve the, uh, the carbon footprint in New York City, reduce those greenhouse gases, and uh, improve the air quality at the same time. One of the real exciting projects we're doing and working with our friends in New York City DEP is the uh, capturing of sewage digester gas from the Newtown Creek uh, Wastewater Treatment Facility. Uh, we're going to be taking that gas uh, cleaning it up and actually injecting it into the natural gas pipeline system in New York. And that will uh, reduce greenhouse gases by about 16,000 tons a year. And uh, that's equivalent to removing about 3,000 cars from the road. A great way to uh, capture and recycle uh, sewage gas uh, rather than letting it be flared into the atmosphere. So with all those things, I again want to congratulate uh, MWA on a great conference, and we look forward to being part of the continuing improvement over the next uh, many years. Thank you. All right, well, it's, uh, we're going to get to the meat of the matter. Uh, I just a uh, short story. Uh, one of our good friends, Hillary Brown, a you know, noted sustainability architect, she, she came into me when I was first starting this job. We were putting together our, our, our policy platform, and with, she came in with a proverbial here on fire and said, Roland, if you're putting together a policy platform for the waterfront and you're not, she actually just come from a lecture by uh, one of our speakers, Klaus Jacob uh, from Columbia University, and said, if you don't uh, recognize and say something about sea level rise, you know, it's probably not worth the paper it's written on. It's the most important issue. She just. Uh, Klaus is known, I think, sometimes as Dr. Doom, and she put the fear of God in her. And, uh, so we did put something in it, and we've been talking and thinking about it since then, and I, I'm so pleased that we're going to have some leading uh, government officials and, and, and a session after this, uh, this luncheon to, to, to talk about it, because I think it is the, the issue of our lifetimes for the waterfront and for, for everything. So to start us off, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce one of my fellow uh, members of the steering committee of the Harbor Coalition, the Executive Director of the New York uh, Environmental Justice Alliance, um, who uh, has really been keying on this issue and will introduce a video from a, a noted expert. And uh, without further ado, please welcome Eddie Bautista. Good afternoon. How is everyone? I love asking this during lunch and getting you guys to talk with your mouths full like that. It's great. Um, I wanted to, I want to thank Roland for inviting me to um, uh, introduce uh, uh, Cynthia Rosenzweig. Actually, when he first told me, I thought it was introducing the actual Cynthia Rosenzweig. Uh, it turns out that uh, Cynthia is in Germany at the uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, when, when, when you're saving the world, you can't be every place at the same time. So. Uh, but Cynthia did send some uh, uh, videotaped remarks, which we'll turn to in a second. Um, I think one of the reasons I, uh, I was both honored and excited about it, being able to introduce Cynthia uh, is because of uh, not just the work that so many of you are familiar with in terms of her championing uh, and shining the light, the necessary light on climate change, um, but from a personal perspective, uh, she was really supportive and helpful to us um, uh, specifically the Environmental Justice Alliance, when two years ago uh, we made a discovery. As the city of New York began its Vision 2020 process um, and its comprehensive waterfront plan update, 
uh, we discovered something a couple of years ago uh, to, to, at a time when we thought we had pretty much exhausted uh, our sense of, of, of the burdens in our communities. Uh, many of you by now know uh, the shameful legacy of the 20th century in terms of the environmental injustices in, certain, in some of our communities. Uh, if you look at the clustering and concentration of toxic uses, of heavy industrial activity, of polluting infrastructure, it's no surprise to many of you that a lot of these uses are cl clustered and concentrated in a handful of communities. Communities that, by the same token and not coincidentally, suffer from some of the highest public health, negative public health indicia, ranging from uh, staggering asthma rates to uh, enormous uh, numbers and rates of uninsured populations. Um, so in addition to us uh, having you know, lived through in our communities, having uh, struggled through this intersection of uh, 20th century public sector indifference and a lot of private sector expediency, uh, we discovered a 21st century wrinkle to this, which is the issue of storm surges and, ri and rising sea levels. Um, one of the things that we discovered was that our communities, most of which are in uh, designated by the Waterfront Revitalization Program areas known as significant maritime and industrial areas, what we discovered was that every single one of these SMIA zones we're in storm surge zones. And by storm surge zones, I'm talking about not just category three and four, we're talking nor'easters and even category one storms. Um, and if you were designing a city today, it stands to reason that we would not have designed a city that would cluster all our heavy temp toxic and chemical uses smack dab in the path of storm surges. But that's what we have right now. Um, to their credit, we've been working with the Bloomberg administration, and they've acknowledged uh, a very difficult task ahead, which is how do we expand our community's community resiliency and adapt to climate change and mitigation in a way that's fair and just and equitable. Um, when we made this discovery, Cynthia Rosenzweig not only encouraged us, but um, uh, stood with us at city council hearings and other public fora and talked about something that's not, frankly, unique to New York City. But if you look at waterfront cities the world over, those communities that are most risk for toxic pollution are the same communities, low-income communities, communities of color in other parts of the world, communities that, that, that are not uh, politically uh, uh, empowered. Um, so before I turn to Cynthia's uh, video, let me just, for, those, for the handful of you at that table that don't know who Cynthia is, Cynthia Rosenzweig is a senior research scientist at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, where she heads the Climate Impacts Group. She recently co-chaired the New York City Panel on Climate Change, a body of experts convened by the mayor to advise the city on adaptation for its critical infrastructure. She co-led the Metropolitan East Coast Regional Assessment of the U.S. National Assessment of the Potential Consequences of Climate Variability and Change. And sponsored, which is sponsored by the U.S. Global Change Research Program. She is also co-editor of the Urban Climate Change Research Network and the, their first re assessment report on climate change in cities, the first ever global interdisciplinary cross-regional science-based assessment to address climate risks, adaptation, mitigation, and policy mechanisms relevant to cities. A recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship she joins impact models with climate models to project future outcomes of both land-based and urban systems under altered climate conditions. Cynthia is also a professor at Barnard College and a senior research scientist at the Earth Institute at Columbia University. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Cynthia Rosenzweig's video. Hello. I'm sorry I couldn't uh, be at the uh, Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance uh, conference on adapting to climate change. Uh, but I'm uh, heading to Germany to participate in a meeting convened by the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is a part of the subsidiary body for scientific and technological advice for the 
delegates who are negotiating the global treaty on climate change. Now let's turn to sea level rise and because of our being a coastal city. The projections show, depending on whether we look only at the climate models or we bring in the potential accel accelerated ice melt from uh, the Greenland and the West Antarctic ice sheets, a range of two to four feet of sea level rise uh, coming by the end of the, uh, the century. Now again, two to four feet, it seems like, yes, we can build sea walls, yes, we could perhaps get ready for that. Again, issue very much arises with storm surge and how the sea level would affect the flooding associated with coastal storms. And there, what we see is that our uh, flood heights now associated with our one in 100 year storms of 8.6 feet would, instead of occurring um, one in 100 years, would be occurring on the order of every 15 to 35 years. So we can see how this uh, inexorable pressure of the rising sea levels can have strong effects on our um, areas nearby, near the coast. Now, why do we care about these projections? What we do in the NPCC and in the climate study is then we, we, and we work with um, folks all around the city and around the state to see that these temperature projections, precipitation projections, sea level rise and coastal storm projections cause impacts on systems that we care about. So for example, all our built environment um, in our water, energy, transportation, and telecommunications infrastructure will be affected by these changes. So the final thing that the organizers asked me to, to share with you is a few of the recommendations that came out of the NPCC uh, and the climate studies. So here are a few of them. Um, and uh, this, these are also can be topics of uh, discussion, I'm sure, during the discussion um, of, uh, during the panel. So one, uh, one thing that we're recommending is that to promote adaptation strategies that enable incremental and flexible adaptations in sectors, among the communities, and across time. So we don't want to get involved in, I, I, the, these uh, advisory bodies really recommended not to get too stuck in rigid adaptation strategies, but to, but to think about doing what makes sense now with an eye to these future uh, projections, but being able to be flexible and um, strengthen adaptation, be able to strengthen adaptations in the future if needed. Uh, we also recommended in the panels and, uh, and the climate study to improve and, and continue to work on public and private stakeholder and general public education and awareness. And so that's why we're so pleased to be um, participating in the uh, M uh, MWA uh, event. So I think that I will end there. I'll, I wish um, you a wonderful panel. I know I. I believe my colleague Bill Selecki will be handling the, uh, will be moderating the panel, and I look forward to hearing about um, the discussion that arose from the event. Thank you very much. All right. Well, we we sorry we lost Cynthia, but uh, we appreciate Eddie's remarks, and we appreciate Bill slipping in as moderator. So Bill Selecki uh, um, is going to was the co-chair. Uh, on the New York City Climate Change Panel, and uh, heads is the director of the CUNY Institute for Sustainable Cities. Um, Kaz Holloway, our good friend, is that the third time at, at the Waterfront Conference? Yes. That is correct. We, a great partner of the MWA, and we really appreciate you being here. Our deputy mayor uh, for operations, and we're honored also to have a representative of the state of New York, uh, assistant commissioner for air resources, climate change, and energy for New York State Department of Environmental um, Conservation, Jared Snyder. So Bill, why don't you uh, take it away, a couple words, and then we'd love to hear from our government officials. Um, okay, there you go. Okay, first of all, thank you, Roland. Thank you for the opportunity to say a few words. 
Uh, I know Cynthia really wanted to be here, but unfortunately she could not. Um, I'll try to sort of carry forward a little bit from some of the comments that, that she just made. Uh, I think one thing that's sort of, you know, uh, kind of that, that kind of wraps around this issue a little bit is that there's obviously so much interest and attention at the waterfront just at a moment when the environment is changing, that we've developed a, a set of very uh, important sort of regulatory opportunities, policies, and so forth to protect us from extreme events and, and from all the other sort of uh, vagaries of the weather. Um, but at this particular moment, as we understand with climate change, that, that, envir that environmental baseline is starting to shift. And so we have to sort of reappreciate and re sort of evaluate all of, the, all of that sort of work that we've done in the 20th century in the context of the, of the environmental change that we see in the 21st. I've, with that, I just want to say one other quick thing to, just sort of, to bring this very much down to the ground. There's a lot of policy and understanding that, uh, that w areas right along the water's edge are vulnerable to, um, to flooding from extreme events and from a, a range of other sort of um, uh, um, um, activities associated with the weather, um, such as the, the location that we're sitting right now. So th these are well documented, well understood. Um, one of the things that we tried to do as part of the NPCC is to understand, well, how is that profile going to change with, with expected climate change? And I think one of the things that's important, there's two very quick takeaways here. One is that the science of that understanding is shifting. So how, how much sea level rise is going to take place is, is a science question that's evolving and, and emerging. And, and with that, so, so comes our, our, our understanding. So we see the range of two to four feet, which Cynthia highlighted. In some ways, if we use one set of models, we can have a number of about two feet of sea level rise in this century. If we use another set of models, which are increasingly being seen as sort of, you know, more appropriate, we could have a much greater amount up to double that. So one of the things that we try to do in the NPCC is, is a very simple uh, statement, is to sort of understand, as I said, how far inland uh, might an extreme event um, that occurs today, how far inland will that same event travel with respect to storm surge 100 years from now? And one of the things that, that became very clear, one, that exercise is fantastically difficult, and to creating those sorts of maps that illustrate that process is, is quite, is quite a, an interesting task. But within that, we defined three particular zones. Those places that we know are already at risk based on our own experience, those places that are far inland that under our current understanding of sea level rise will never be connected to um, uh, a storm surge. But then there's all that middle ground that middle ground that we have to sort of evaluate with respect to understanding maybe these are places that are now at risk to extreme events. Maybe this is infrastructure, neighborhoods, communities that weren't understood to be at risk in, in, in the current conception of, of this regulation, but will become so with sea level rise. So those are just a couple of takeaways. One, the science is evolving, and our understanding of what that means on the actual landscape creates a very dynamic environment in which to make policy. Um, so with that, I would like to sort of shift it over to, to um, um, my, the two panelists to sort of comment, uh, bring forward their thoughts, and then we can sort of move forward with the general discussion. So um, I think on the, the list we have Jared first. Um, oh, is that right? Um, I'm, I'm happy to go first. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It's, I'm sorry. It's actually Cass. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Well, I'm glad we cleared that up. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. I'm Cass Holloway, Deputy Mayor for Operations. It's great to be here, and I just would like to take a second to acknowledge Roland. Um, if we could give him a round of applause. Not, not just because uh, he invites me to go on boat rides and has me come to this conference every year, but I think as this conference has grown from year to year uh, and the stakeholders, the engagement, and the level of uh, real collaboration and participation has increased, this has become quite uh, an incredible event, and I'm sure it's going to continue. So thank you, Roland. Um, you know, uh, and, and also I see a lot of familiar faces out there, so I'm not going to risk offending anybody, um, so I won't mention any of you. Um, thanks for having me here today. Uh, I have been uh, in the Bloomberg administration since the beginning of the second term. Uh, at the beginning of the third term, I started, I served as DEP commissioner where uh, the operational impacts, uh, potential operational impacts, and the need for long-term investment um, for climate resilience really came to the fore for me. And now as deputy mayor for operations, I'm really able to just carry that forward to the entire operations of the city. Um, sea level rise. You know, New York City has 520 miles of coastline. 
that we face real and significant sea level rise uh, risks. And as has been noted, Cynthia and Bill headed uh, the mayor's panel on climate change, um, which had uh, produced a number of findings on which we are now making real operational and investment decisions. 200,000 New Yorkers live within a FEMA-designated one in 100-year flood zone. Um, these include neighborhoods, industry, as Eddie Bautista mentioned, um, and we need to deal with that. One of the significant findings of the panel is that the, um, uh, the sea level rise has gone for about an inch a year per decade, but as we've heard, that is increasing and could increase significantly, and by the century's end, we could see uh, precipitation and temperatures um, significantly above where they are now. Now, the mayor's sustainability blueprint, Plan YC, which I know is well known to everybody here, has more than 30 initiatives that include up to more than a billion dollars of investment in climate resilience. And I think the strategies can be broken into three big categories. First, we are actively changing both the physical design of the city um, and the way that city agencies operate, uh, from reducing emissions um, to adapting our major facilities to the possibility of sea level rise. Second, we're enhancing New Yorkers' climate readiness. Um, and I think we've seen through Hurricane Irene, and it, it's interesting, you know, whether you attribute a particular event to climate change or not, we are seeing significant increases in highly volatile weather. Uh, and as somebody who was personally involved in the city's response to that, just the fact that we had planned and were able to execute something of that scale, which was really the first mass evacuation of a portion of the city ever um, within the course of six days, was pretty incredible, but a tribute to how important this planning is and will be. And then finally, there's the science. The panel did its work, but increasing the understanding of climate risks um, and using those, the data to drive sensible investment. Um, so from the tops of our buildings to the depths of the building code, um, the city is really making uh, the investments, putting its money where its mouth is. One example of this is the green infrastructure plan. On the one hand, it's an investment in water quality. On the other hand, the whole point of that plan is to make the city more permeable, uh, which means it is going to be more able to absorb what we are seeing not only through sea level rise, but also the prediction of increased and more intense rainfalls in New York City. Um, you know, water is also incredibly important here, and at DEP, the, one of the things I would look at every two weeks is the reservoir levels. And because of the more intense and frequent storms, you can have turbidity impacts that could make it very hard for us to divert water to the city that we need to drink. So this goes beyond sea level rise, um, really the weather uh, and climate impacts stretch across the entire, you know, the provision of basic, basic services in every agency. Uh, EDC, or Economic Development Corporation, has been doing several projects to redesign the edge of New York City, including replacing seawalls and bulkheads. And some of the parks that are the signature achievements of the Bloomberg administration, uh, particularly I'm thinking here Brooklyn Bridge Park, have adapted both um, to be able to take more water by having a, a salt plants that are uh, adapted to salt, um, salt water, uh, but also in, uh, comprehensive stormwater management systems. Um, now, in terms of codes and standards, we've already amended the city's building code to require uh, reflective painting of rooftops to deal with heating, and we recently enacted uh, Zone Green with Amanda Burden, which now allows building owners to move critical equipment to rooftops. Small changes like this um, enable builder, people who are building and making investments in the city to make smart decisions. Now, in a day or two, we're going to uh, release another plan, the city's first comprehensive wetland strategy. I think a lot of people in this room have probably seen this plan in draft. Um, and wetlands uh, are important for a lot of reasons. Uh, when it comes to climate change, I think you can look at it in terms of their protective capacity and then also their ability to deal with um, naturally uh, cleaning and enhancing water quality. So the plan is going to uh, call for the creation of 75 new acres of parkland um, and transferring uh, parcels to the, new the Parks Department. Um, I think most importantly, working with DEC, who you'll hear from in a minute, we want to look at the creation of a mitigation bank. Um, and this is something that New Jersey has already successfully done 
uh, and you know, New York City hates to be behind when it comes to New Jersey. So uh, we're going to work closely with DEC on that. Um, and, uh, and in terms of restoration, we're going to form a natural areas conservancy so that we can continue to make and build on the $48 million in natural wetland restorations that are already underway with our partners, particularly in the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, now, finally, and I'll end on this note, uh, to continue to make informed risk-based decisions, we have to keep uh, studying the science, not just for findings, but also the, what the potential impacts of climate change are. Um, and through Plan YC and our OLTPS office, we've convened a panel that is looking at three areas in the city uh, as a pilot for the development of a natural hazard risk model. Um, and 26 city, state, and federal agencies are involved in this. Um, and we're looking at the Rockaways, uh, a particularly important area, particularly given last summer, Lower Manhattan and Astoria. Um, and we are launching uh, with that assessment, we're looking at the infrastructure, not only that government agencies have, that, but that private agencies have, and we are building a hazard risk model that's going to be able to tell us where we think the greatest potential impacts are so that we can invest dollars smartly um, and not just kind of spread money like peanut butter all over the city. Uh, so it's a, this I think is going to be, be one of the most significant um, planning tools that we're going to have to go citywide before the end of the Bloomberg administration, and then hopefully uh, it will be implemented. So I'll stop there. You know, there's a lot more to talk about, but uh, I know we want to get to uh, the discussion part. Thank you. And, and now we'll hear from Jared Schneider. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you for inviting us to be here. Commissioner Martens uh, was planning on attending, but he he often loses control over his calendar, and he was called off in a different direction. Um, so I, I prepared some remarks for Commissioner Martens, but I'd, I'd like to, to sort of start off by departing a little bit from what I prepared. When I, each time I come to New York City, I, I live in Albany now, um, each time I come to New York, I'm amazed by differences that I see in New York City, the greening of the city. And, uh, you know, for example, walking here today, I was up on, what, what's it called, the High Walk? The high, never been there before, never even heard of it. And I'm, I'm walking over here from the train station and there, there I see these people walking, you know, 20 feet above the ground and there's, and there's you know, trees and everything. And so I got up there and walking, it was, it was terrific. And uh, I have to do a conference call after this. I think I'm gonna settle on one of those benches and, and have my phone call. But, uh, but then another example is, is tomorrow, um, and this, this is sort of more on the waterfront theme, um, I'm going to be back in town with my 11-year-old son playing uh, for his Albany-based soccer team against a local team called Downtown United, I think is what it's named, and they're playing on, the, on Pier 40, which is at the end of Houston Street. Probably all you guys know that. You all know about the soccer fields there. Well, that's news to me. I mean, I used to live in Soho, and that's where I parked my car. And, and now, now kids are playing soccer there, and I just sort of love the the picture that presents of, you know, from parking garage to playing fields. So, um, now obviously that's just one example of, of all the things that New York City is doing um, to, to build a greener city. Um, I'm, a bike, I'm a biker, I see the bike paths, um, there's the bike sharing system that was just announced, green infrastructure, which Kaz mentioned, um, the list goes on and on. And, but, but unfortunately, despite those efforts, despite the efforts that, that New York State is taking, many other governments, businesses, um, climate change is happening. Um, this past March was the warmest March we ever had. The 12 months starting last May through this April were the warmest 12 months we have ever had. Um, and the, these rising temperatures have many ramifications for New York State. There's increased air pollution, loss of habitat, deadly heat waves, um, migration of disease-carrying pests that haven't previously been up here. And of course, for, for this conference, sea level rise is most important. Um, now, last, Kaz mentioned to the, the storm last summer, you know, I think the city was somewhat lucky that that it sort of ducked a bullet there as the storm switched um, direction a little bit. Um, and people in upstate New York weren't nearly as lucky. I mean, there was tremendous devastation up there. But, but that's an example 
really, I think, sort of a bellwether of what is to come with the changing climate and how we need to get prepared for that. Um, now, there's also more subtle effects of, of rising sea levels. There's the loss of habitat I mentioned. Um, one example that we see down in this area um, are the, the loss of salt marshes, which are an important habitat, um, an important ecosystem in this urban area. Jamaica Bay, Pelham Bay, they're also on Long Island, and we're losing those. And um, you know, that's, that's one of the areas where, that we need to keep in mind as we you know, prepare for the change in climate. And then, as Eddie mentioned, you know, of particular importance are the communities. And, and basically, I, I was going to say pretty much the same things that Eddie said about, you know, we, we realize that many of the most at-risk communities um, it, to, to a changing climate and rising sea levels are environmental justice communities that are, that, that are already exposed to, um, to more pollutants, to issues of, of, of contaminants in the vicinity, and that just becomes scarier and more dangerous when you recognize the potential of flooding on top of it. So, so what are we doing about that as policymakers? What are we doing about it in Albany? Um, you know, unlike many other environmental issues that, that we deal with, um, dealing with climate change requires partnerships. Um, sort of t considering we're on the waterfront, I'll, I'll, I'll say it requires an all-hands-on-deck approach um, that it, it's very different from the way we normally do rulemaking. I, I'm, I'm in the, or policy making, I'm in the air quality area and, and, um, and, and climate change and, and, you know, generally when we do air quality regulations, it's, the, the work we do is fairly straightforward. You know, we, we identify a, a problem source, power plants, motor vehicles. We know the technology, we know what kind of emission reductions we needed, so we develop regulations that require emission controls in those places. We have the science that enables us to do that. That's our bread and butter. Climate change is very, very different. Um, we're, we're dealing with a changing um, science scenario. The science is always developing. And we have to look at it from a much longer time frame. Um, we also need to, to look across every walk of, of life. I mean, everything we do as a society affects climate change, affects um, you know, our, our, our carbon footprint. And so there's no sort of one single regulator that, bear, that has all the answers. We, we need to use all the tools we have available from the various different policymakers. So let me just tell you a little bit about what we're doing in, in New York State. Um, first to mitigate climate change and then on the adaptation side. Um, on the mitigation side, one of the innovative um, efforts that we have is the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, um, which caps and reduces emissions from the power sector. Um, and that sounds sort of traditional, but one of the things that's very different about it is, is we are auctioning off the allowances and we're using the proceeds to invest in energy efficiency and clean energy. And the result of that is we're creating jobs at a time we need jobs, and we're actually reducing electricity bills. A study came out, um, a, an independent study came out a few months ago that the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative across the, the region is reducing electricity bills by over a billion dollars. And that's con that, you know, that stands in stark contrast to the usual idea that when we regulate, we increase costs. We're actually reducing costs with this regulatory approach. Um, we're, all, we're doing a number of other things um, in, on the mitigation side. One area that we're starting to look at is the, the transportation side. Again, we're taking a multi-state approach of working with our partners in other states to figure out how we can sort of apply the REGI model to reduce emissions across the transportation system. Um, the governor has also announced a number of initiatives. One is the New York Sun Initiative. Um, which is going to restore New York's leadership in solar power. It's going to double the, the installation of solar power in 2012 from what it was in 2011 and then quadruple it in 2013. And, uh, you know, sort of, as I mentioned, we need to bring everybody that has a policy-making role to the table. We're working with communities in something called the Climate Smart Communities Program and the Governor's Cleaner Greener Communities Program. There's, the Climate Smart Communities Program, there's 103 communities that have taken the Climate Smart Communities Pledge 
to take steps to reduce their emissions and prepare for a changing climate. And um, so we're providing them the tools so they can make the smart decisions on a community level so that we reduce carbon footprint across New York State. So let me move on a little bit to, to adaptation um, and you know, what we're doing to prepare for the, the changing climate that is coming despite what we do. What we do can actually reduce the amount the climate changes, but it is going to change and we need to be prepared for that. So again, there's several different agencies involved. New York City obviously plays a critical role in New York City, which is a very unique community in New York State, different from everything else, all the other communities that we work with. Um, Department of Transportation and MTA play a role in ensuring that the transportation system can be resilient to a changing climate. Department of State has, has, has several roles. Um, it, it is responsible for our building codes, so we can, it can you know, de develop building codes that make buildings more resilient. Um, it's also working with DEC and other agencies on the Climate Smart Communities Program to develop a guide to coastal community resilience that we hope to get out to stakeholders in the, the fairly near future. Um, turning to, to my agency, DEC, we're, we're evaluating some of the ways that, that we can play a leadership role. One of the recommendations of the Sea Level Rise Task Force was that there needs to be an official uh, official adoption of a sea level rise projection that can be used in New York State so that everybody that's making decisions that affect the waterfront, affect the coastlines, can look at a projection and say, well, that's how much sea level is projected to rise. So we're looking at our authority to develop that official projection so that we have that tool that all the policymakers can use. We're also working with the city and other agencies um, on coordinating mapping methodologies for, for mapping sea level rise projections and, and sharing the data that, that could be used to identify the resources in need of protection. And much additional research is needed, and I think maybe this is anticipating a little bit of the dialogue to, to follow. Um, but, but, you know, this is an extremely complex area, and more and more information, more and more research helps us make the right decisions. So, you know, I think that's um, enough for me for now, and I'll uh, send it back to Bill for okay. conversation. Great. Great, thank you. Um, I just want to pick up on that point. I, I just want to pick up that point for a moment um, in the remaining moments of this session uh, with the notion of um, what do we know and, and what don't we know, and, and what does that mean with respect to policy? I mean, there, there's a lot of knowledge that has been brought forward about um, what climate change might look like. In fact, we can sort of look at the climate record for the city of New York and for the state. We know that the climate has been shifting already in some ways, some, some significant ways. Um, and we can sort of look into the future. But there, there are big things that we don't still, we still don't fully understand. I mean, some of the things that are um, very relevant to the coast, like probably the most obvious is the the frequency and intensity of, of hurricanes and other sort of extreme events like nor'easters are, sort of, are still sort of beyond our, our sort of modeling and sort of science understanding of how that might shift into the future. Certainly there's a lot of logic that those kinds of extreme events could become more frequent, but that's still, that's still yet to be defined. Um, so there's a lot of things sort of still working out there that, that I think demands a lot of, of, of understanding that the science could change. I mean, one of the other things to keep in mind is that you know every few years the the international science community sort of redoes its sort of set of of, of models to sort of look at, at global climate processes and they're, they're, the next uh, wave of that is now underway and with that there's been a lot of understanding about um, how emissions rates have changed and in many cases they're far exceeding what some of the early projections had been just five or six years ago. So where the, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions and other things that are changing the, the global climate, um, we're actually exceeding these expectations. So this new round of modeling that's going to be coming forward could present a slightly uh, more, um, uh, I don't want to use the word dire or pessimistic, but a sort of a, a, an aggressive process of, of climate change in the future. Um, and so these, these understandings of the rates of sea level rise could, could shift. I mean, literally they've shifted, they've increased significantly in the past five years, 
in the next couple of years, we could see further growth of that. So there is that demand for flexibility. And um, as part of this panel, I was, I, we, we had this discussion about sort of posing a couple of questions to, to the folks you know, on, on, you know, in the trenches and, sort of, um, and beyond, and people sort of leading the policy agenda as, as well, um, with respect to how to understand the science and the capacity to build policy that is flexible. So I just, I'll, I'll just sort of briefly uh, sketch out a couple of these questions, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn it open for discussion. So with respect to the panel, um, what have been the, the most significant challenges in the construction of public policy that is flexible in response to emerging climate science risk information and the complex character and demands of waterfront interests and the sites, uh, waterfront sites. So, you know, how has it been to sort of create this policy in this new emerging science? So there's, there's really important lessons that I know that have been learned already. And then the question, sort of going back to the science community and to maybe all of us as well, how can the climate science be better packaged and produced in the future to provide even um, more opportunities for the development of effective, proactive, and flexible climate policy. So again, there's been this dialogue, and it's been personally very rich for, for me and, and colleagues like Cynthia in working with policymakers to connect between the science and the policy. So the question is, how do we create policies that are flexible in the face of new science, and how can we make the science better to meet that demand of flexible policy? So I'll. I'll toss that back to whomever wants to pick up that or related points. Okay, well, you know, let me uh, start with just a couple of observations, and maybe this can sort of be a back and forth almost. I mean, there's a, lot, a whole lot to chew on there. Um, you know, I, I, I think we need to, rec we can't be paralyzed by the fact that the science is changing. We know that emissions are growing, whether they're growing you know, by 2% by a year worldwide, 4%, 6%, they're growing because of China and India and, and you know, all the parts of the world that are, are starting to develop our way of life and drive cars and et cetera. So that's happening. We, need, we understand that. We know that sea level is going to rise. We maybe don't know whether it's going to rise 2 feet or 4 feet, but it's going to be rising. So, so we can't be paralyzed by the, by the lack of certainty. We can look for policies that make sense regardless of the way the science develops. Um, you know, what, what an additional complicating factor, I think, is the, the, the many different stakeholders that are involved. As, as policymakers, we're not dictators. We work with our stakeholders and develop approaches that, 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 that make sense and, and, and can work um, given the, the goals and interests of, of, of all of our citizens. And, so, you know, what we do is we look for the kind of policies that, that, that at first, that can really satisfy the needs of the various stakeholders. And, you know, I gave Reggie as an example where this is a policy that reduces emissions and creates jobs and helps economic development. And we're showing that works and, and then others can build upon that. Um, you know, Cynthia Rosenzweig is in the conference in Bonn. I was on a phone call with somebody in Berlin this morning. They mentioned that Jonathan Pershing, the U.S. representative to those climate negotiations, in, in his presentation talked about what the East Coast and the West Coast is doing with cap and trade programs to reduce emissions. So it's sort of that policy leadership helps us, shows what policies work, and helps us then make policy decisions that work regardless of the changing science. Uh, okay, so maybe to build on that, I think that uh, on the question of flexible policy, one of the challenges th that you face uh, in flexibility is what do, you, what do you mandate? What do you say people must do? And, and what, do you, what do you allow? So on the uh, I think that zone green codes, I can give examples of both of these, which basically looked at the codes and said, do we even have the right set of policies in place that would enable a conscientious developer of residential or commercial real estate to make smart climate adaptive investments, where they put the infrastructure, where they put you know, their critical equipment to protect um, you know, whether it's at the water's edge or from intense precipitation, which, by the way, can be just as damaging, um, and even wind. Uh, and so you have those which are not mandating that things be put in certain places, but 
as a first step, allowing it and then advertising that it's allowed. If you look at stormwater, we're taking a mandatory approach. The city recently enacted uh, uh, a uh, set of stormwater rules that will uh, that raise the level of stormwater that developers have to handle on their own properties by an order of magnitude. It used to be 2.5 cubic feet per second, now it's 0.25. Um, that is a policy decision where we're saying, look, you don't have the choice. You have to manage this on site because the city's infrastructure, the public infrastructure uh, on its own is not going to be sufficient to deal with it. I think personally where we are between those two things strikes a good balance for now based on what we know. Uh, but I think both rules also uh, demonstrate that, look, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty on what the data show. Is it two feet? Is it four feet? Um, the fact is we have 14 wastewater treatment plants, all of them by uh, the water's edge. And uh, we know that this rise is going to happen. And we know, I mean, if you look at uh, Hurricane Irene, for example, just the surge that did happen um, had the possibility of taking out our wastewater treatment plants. And because of some of the elevation of equipment that we've done and investments that we've made, that didn't happen. Um, but uh, it would be foolish for the city to say, well, we're not quite sure whether it's going to be two feet or four feet, um, and so we don't have to really deal with this right now. <laughs> um, uh, I think that at, a, at an operational level for the city, uh, even with that uncertainty, it doesn't impact, uh, it isn't so uncertain that we're not able to make investments and act. And I think that's where, you know, the difference between mandatory and allowable um, is one of the places to to inject that flexibility. Okay. I, I like the way you phrased that. Um, Roland, were you going to step or Okay. Well, one of the things I want to sort of mention is sort of tying this together. I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a particularly interesting moment. Obviously, there, there are a couple of things that were mentioned. One is that New York City is, uh, and New York State for that matter as well, is, is an international leader. I mean, the folks are in Berlin and other places are looking, uh, you know, at what cities like New York are doing. New York is very much uh, seen as a, as, as, as a model. And I think the other thing to sort of think about is that, you know, even though there is that sort of capacity that we've, we've had um, to present a, a, a model case, the, the possibility of learning still, still takes place. And I think Hurricane Irene and, and what we just experienced this past, um, um, uh, the end of the summer, and then all the other sort of aberrant weather, uh, I think we need to look at those events very carefully and from them distill those lessons learned, both with, with respect to adaptation, but where, do we, where can we still improve the science, at least that's from my perspective, in understanding what the impact of these events are going to be. Um, and with that, I think we'll draw this session to a close, unless there are closing comments from, from either the two no, panelists. Thank and uh, thank you all. And, um, thank you. Thank you. Bill, Kaz, and Jared, thank you very, very much. All right, folks, I'll just give you uh, some news you can use. Uh, if I can have your attention even back there. Uh, first of all, uh, we're going to take a short break. I think we're, gonna, we're almost back on schedule. Uh, about a 13-minute break, and then we'll start per our regular schedule for the next set of sessions. Second, look on the back of your thing. You should have uh, your, your congressional district noted. Uh, and if you uh, are able to come to the second session, a workshop uh, where the 14 different congressional represent offices will be represented here right in this room. We'll be talking about priorities in each of their districts. I think it's going to be a great discussion. And then finally, or not finally, penultimately, we're going to have a uh, boat tour, a cocktail boat tour, uh, at 5 o'clock. So if you want to end the day with a bit of fellowship and uh, meet in, in, in a more casual setting, many of your fellow uh, uh, participants, please join us. It'll, we'll be li uh, leaving a, the Hornblower Hybrid, a, br a brand new boat from uh, Statue Cruises. It's going to be right here at Pier 60. Um, and also, it's a very innovative new boat. We'll be hearing about it from uh, Terry uh, McRae, the, new, uh, the uh, head of Hornblower, about what's new and different about the Hornblower hybrid. And then finally, tomorrow morning, up at Pier 66 Maritime by the Frying Pan, we'll be continuing our conference there. So again, uh, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. See you on the boat. And may, I'll see many of you tomorrow morning up at uh, the Frying Pan. Thank you. <laughs>